the one theme that comes out very, very strongly, spoke about it this morning and again in those sessions, is the rise of the conscious consumer. Uh, much more than ever before, they're very interested in their food. My nutritionist uh, tells me um, that food is all about me. That's the consumer perspective. And I saw Ian's reference to one size fits one, which it seems to be another expression of it. Um, uh, that means there's no escaping greater um, transparency, ultimately. Uh, the farming sector is going to be scrutinised much, much more. Uh, we need to embrace that and work with that, or we'll be left behind pretty quickly. But the key risk uh, arising from that process, if we're not nimble enough, responsive enough, and don't work these processes, is ultimately the basic stranded infrastructure problem, that we make a move, we zig, and the consumer zags, even when they promised they would zig. And um, we're just left explaining to bankers why it all went wrong. And um, while that's a bit uh, of a downer, uh, it is a relevant challenge and one that needs to be engaged with. As I say, <clears throat> that engagement involves working out how you're going to place your bets. And I thought it would be worth trying to bring to life a couple of different scenarios um, that showed the way in which this uh, could play out in practice. I'll call that the tale of two farmers. So we have the first uh, who decides to go high spec. I've stuck with eggs, but I've tried to make these comments um, generalised to the whole of agriculture. But looking at these Omega-3 eggs, they're organic, they're uh, grain-fed, pasture-raised, they're, they're anything that we've heard that consumers um, are interested in. And it's part of a um, clearly thought out business strategy, diversified and segment focused. Um, it's also supported by a lot of marketing uh, that will um, continue to remind uh, customers the wonders of these products. But there's still risks that go along with this strategy. It, it might be um, hitting on what's hip uh, right now, what consumers have told us through marketing surveys that they want. And how do we know they're going to stick with it? And whether it's vertical farms uh, or you know, small, nimble entry, infrastructure still costs money. So what does this farmer do uh, to protect themselves? Well, uh, I'd propose that they're going to, similar to the way that um, Rachel and Emma were setting out, engage with consumers in a much more uh, formalised way, a much more extensive way and well-resourced way. Um, and ensure that those consumers continue to understand um, the perception of value of the product offering and demonstrate um, that they're going to get what they pay for and that they should uh, trust the supply chain. And there's some very interesting comments about that consumers don't want to know every little detail and they'll, they'll get by with a descriptor into which they can pack their own values. But uh, when I heard that, I thought, yes, but that narrative that you develop around it mustn't have any cracks. Um, it must be genuine and authentic and it must not leave you exposed to not being able to withstand that scrutiny. Ultimately, this farmer is successful, even in the terrifying world painted by um, Ian, by continuing to engage with the consumer, uh, they're able to um, have a successful farming business and be part of the picture that we're trying to paint in 2030, 2035. Our second farmer, goes the other way. They have a perspective that affordable fresh protein will always be in style um, and they go with a, a low spec, fantastic uh, quality product. They focus on consolidation and scale and efficiency. And as it relates to innovation, they're constantly innovating, but that is ultimately process innovation uh, to come up with um, um, even more affordable products going into the future. So what's the risk that they face? The risk is, of course, that consumers move on. And it's not just consumers, it's the community as well. And I would say more importantly, it is the community. So you might have a, a good solid segment of the um, market of consumers, let's say 50%, that think this is the product for them, this is the product for all time. They like affordability, they don't have a lot of money. Um, but they're not the only ones with a relevant voice and the rest of the community is going to have a perspective on whether the production system that underpins this, uh, it, you know, accords with their values, uh, and, and obviously their values, they're 50% of, the, um, of the market, oh, sorry, of the consumers, um, is a very significant voice and will carry sway with people like regulators and governments um, that set standards. So there is a considerable uh, vulnerability with respect to this business, even, they're doing, they're, even though they're doing exactly what their consumers want. So what do they do about it? 
Well, oddly enough, they do exactly the same thing. Um, they have to engage with consumers and work out what makes them tick. They don't just ask them what they want, they understand why it is uh, that they want this. And they have to demonstrate transparency and build trust. Uh, they need to be constantly engaging with consumers and assuring them and providing them the transparency and information required so that consumers provide their acceptance and the community provides its acceptance of this production system. Now in this case, no one's smart and no one's dumb. We had two very different strategies, um, but two winners. And of course, the question is then asked, well, what's the common theme? And the common theme really flows from all of the presentations um, that you've heard. And it's an increased focus on community engagement. We have to move on from um, what the community or consumers might think, which I think is highly relevant, but a little one dimensional. Tell us what you want and we'll give it to you. Uh, even uh, Ian's terrifying presentation is really useful in that regard because it shows it's, it's too dynamic for that. Uh, we can't rest on our laurels and think, oh, we did the survey, we got the info, we can be confident this will be the case into the future. We need to understand why. And uh, Rachel um, spoke uh, about her discipline that she brings to bear in that regard. And I do feel in a way that I've come today to basically run an ad for, for Rachel's <laughs> uh, business because um, it, it's that discipline that's going to be enormously valuable to um, the agricultural sector in the future, in my view. I should say this is not pioneering talk. These concepts have been uh, around for many, many years, and there are industries and um, you know individual farming uh, businesses that are doing this. They're absolutely doing it. In many cases, they're ahead of Australian eggs. We're learning a lot from them, um, but we're catching up. My prediction is that, or my, my perspective is, actually they're not doing enough, we're not doing enough, everyone needs to lift their game, and for anyone who thinks, ah, oh, this is silly, this, is, this will blow over, I think they're the ones that are really at risk of being left behind uh, on this front. I make a point here about industry focus because it is difficult to do this, or more difficult, I think, on an ind independent company basis. Um, and there are uh, good reasons to, um, to do it at an industry level. Um, it's very difficult to have competing narratives out there, uh, you know, which have the risk of cutting each other down and leaving either the sector and the consumer with not much to work with. So using the industry as a single voice um, to demonstrate uh, the traceability and the trust that the consumers need has value. It's also a really expensive process. And um, if it's done properly and full scale and well, and it's constant, it's not something you're going to do and then say, oh, I'm confident now, I've managed my risk, I'm gonna move on. Um, it's just going to be part of the way in which we do business. And I think um, that ef efficiency can be brought to the process by using research development corporations such as Australian Eggs, uh, also industry representative bodies uh, and other pharma groups and, and the research organisations, of course, um, to contribute to the process in the most efficient way. That will also lead to a wonderful cross-pollination of ideas because you're going to see the same values popping up across different supply chains. I don't believe that these issues are all um, industry specific and can be localised. Um, that's all I was going to bring to bear at first instance. Some of those perspectives are common to the other speakers. Some uh, are slightly different. I fear the poll that Nikolai will now run to work out whether I'm right or wrong, uh, but I'll subject myself to the process. Thank you.